So we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Genesis on uh, the life and the story of Joseph and all of the other people who are connected, his family, his father, his brothers, and of course, uh, this whole nation, uh, this empire of Egypt as well. And so we're transitioning into that part of the narrative this morning in chapter 39. Uh, We're going to be looking at this part of the story where Uh, Joseph is tragically sold into slavery uh, in Egypt and thus begins uh, the whole narrative in the biblical text in the Old Testament on the slavery of the people of God, of their bondage ultimately in Egypt and their deliverance and God's ransom as the story unfolds. Uh, So here we are with Joseph, and this sermon is called Betrayal in Prison, and we're going to be thinking this morning about uh, the difficult topic of suffering, uh, but also hope, and I want you to hang your hat this morning on one phrase, in the midst of suffering, God is with us. That is the word for this morning, that God was with Joseph, and he is with you. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come to the text of Scripture this morning, we pray that all of the distractions of life would fade. Lord, that we would uh, be unconcerned in the best sense of how I can say that. Lord, with all of the minutia of life, the worries and the concerns about where we need to be next, where we need to go, the responsibilities that we have, the bills that we have to pay, the relationships in our lives, whatever they are, Lord, help us in this moment to know that as we engage your word and we hear you speak, that we will receive good instruction and guidance that will help us in all of those details and in all of those matters of our lives. So set our hearts and minds fixed on your spirit, on your love, on Christ's presence in our midst. We offer you this time, Lord, for the purposes of your kingdom and to your glory. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Genesis 39, I invite you to turn there with me. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to uh, bring that with you on these mornings, whether it's uh, in printed version or it's on your phone, so that you can continue to follow along. These are long stories, uh, so it's always good to refer back to it throughout the sermon. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt And Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So he is bought now as a slave. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. So you see how the narrative begins. The Lord, Yahweh, God, was with Joseph, therefore he prospered. When the master of the house saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed this household, this household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord, that is God's covenant faithfulness, was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. It was extended through his servant. So Potiphar left everything in the hand of Joseph's care. 
With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built, and he was handsome. So you remember from last week, he was 17 when his brothers betrayed him. So he's a young man. He's probably around 20, and he's growing up. After a while, his master's wife took notice of him. Uh, It's a little bit lame. She was into him. She thought he was hot, and she wanted him, is what the text actually should say here. And so she asked him to come to bed with her. That is a very polite way of saying that she wanted to sleep with him. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, of my master, sorry, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, in his house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So the answer is no, lady. How could I do such a wicked thing against God and against Potiphar? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be in her presence. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. So she caught him by his cloak. It's Joseph's cloak again. This time it's uh, the outer coat. She said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make a sport of us, that is, to disgrace the household. He came here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. And she kept the cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you bought came to me to disgrace me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of his wife saying, this is how the slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and threw him in prison. So we're going to return to that line again. That's a familiar line in the story. He was taken and he was thrown. And the place where he was thrown this time was not the cistern, but it was the king's prison where he was confined as a prisoner of the king, the pharaoh. But while Joseph was there in the prison... Yahweh was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison this time. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, just like Potiphar did, because Yahweh was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. And this is the reading of the word of the Lord. The reality of suffering, my friends, is something that we often avoid discussing, and that is very understandable. It is, by definition, painful. Suffering is heart-wrenching, and it is at times a reality that can just really rip your life apart. And so we would rather kind of turn the eye away from that and just move on from things. When we suffer, 
when we go through trials and tribulations, we're taken right to the edge of the cliff. And oftentimes, we feel like we are going to fall off and we're going to get really hurt or we're just going to crash and burn and die. And so we try to draw back. But we also ask questions at this point. Where is God? Is one of the most common questions that we ask, whether it's in our hearts or whether it comes out of our lips, whether it develops inside of us as a point of resentment toward God, not just people. We ask where God is. And then we ask the other question, and it's the why me question, right? We can all relate. This is common ground for our human experience. Why me, Lord? Or, as I have heard recently, which really has transformed my perspective, I've heard people say to me who are suffering greatly in their life, why not me? Hmm. Why not me, Lord? There's a deep maturity, spiritual maturity, that lies underneath that question. How we face the reality of suffering, it depends on our perspective on life and on the situation at hand. It depends on where our heart is, and it also depends on how we view God, right? How you view God will have a direct impact on this whole matter. And in one sense, The story of Joseph is a story of suffering. It's a story of faith under fire. It's a story of trust in God fired in the furnace of tribulation. But most importantly, it is a story of God with us in the trial, in the fire. He is present. And so, You know, you can think ahead in the scriptures to a very, very popular and common story, the story of Daniel. A long, long time, hundreds of years later, where he's, you know, being literally fired up with his friends in the furnace under the evil empire, another one, Babylon, and there is the angel of the Lord with them in the furnace. And so this is a story that goes throughout Scripture and develops as we read along in the redemptive narrative. But today, we look at Genesis 39. Last week, the story began with Joseph betrayed by his brothers. He was forcefully stripped of his robe. He was taken. You saw that word again in the text this morning. And he was thrown into an empty cistern and he was sold to human traffickers. His brother's envy caused them to hate his good fortune to the extent that they desired to destroy it and him. That's what we talked about last week. That is what envy will do to you. It will cause you to want all that is good in other people's lives to be washed away so that you can somehow feel better in the future. Today, we pick up the story with Joseph stripped of his freedom, carted down to Egypt, and purchased by Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt. And now Pharaoh is going to become a very central figure in the rest of the story of the Hebrews into uh, the time of Moses, right? So they're now introduced into this land, And they will eventually reside there and they will flourish there after Joseph's life. But then they're all going to be, in a sense, sold into slavery. All of Joseph's descendants and the descendants of his brothers. So it's the starting place. And it is a place of desperation. Can you imagine this? Like, what would you be thinking? Don't don't stand back from this narrative today. Insert yourself emotionally and mentally into the narrative. You're young. You have all of your life in front of you. 
you know, maybe you're in good health. That's part of what the story is here. You know, he looked good. He was a, he was a big guy. He had things going on. And then the next thing you know, the guy's sold into slavery. And all of the blessings turn into a brutal curse. That's what it looks like on the outside. So what would you be thinking in this case? Like, man, God's really working in my life right now, isn't he? I'm being blessed of the Lord, right? Not a chance. This, This guy, he had the blessing. He was the favorite son, which really means that he was going to be the inheritor of the blessing of his father, and that's part of what the brothers hated, is that there was probably a transferal of blessing and material property and wealth that was going on in the family. Now, he's stripped bare, he's sold into slavery. So there's not a chance that this guy is thinking that life is great at this point. So this is where Genesis 39.2 comes into full focus. It is the but God moment. The but God moment. The narrator reminds us of the most important truth of all. But Yahweh, the God of covenant love and faithfulness, translated in your English Bible, the Lord, was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, even though he was a high-ranking slave. God was with him, and he gave him success. So in a sense, he filled his hands back up. He had been emptied, and now he's getting filled back up again. So he's on the incline. He was down in the valley, and it looks like things are going up. But God, who is rich in mercy, will fill Joseph's hands again and again throughout the story, ultimately using them to save the lives of many. That is how the narrative is now developing as a full story. So what's going to happen? There's an echo ahead here, a looking ahead. What man intends for evil, God intends for good to accomplish his purposes. And Joseph probably thinks at this, th- this time that things are getting back on track. The text says that Joseph's master saw that the Lord was with him and everything he was doing was made to succeed in his hand. So Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and served him and was put in charge of the whole household. So the imagery of the hand is also essential to the story. There's an emptying and there's a filling that's going on all throughout here. There's a blessing that comes, and it comes not only to Joseph, but to to the entire house, and his blessing is on everything. And God can give blessing, and he can take away blessing, and it is up to him. It is not up to us. So the promise, the promise is this. The favor and the blessing of God follows his faithful people. The blessing of the Lord always follows his faithful people. And it flows out to all of those around us. That is the nature of the kingdom of God. That's how it works. It comes and it flows out like a river. That's how the blessing of the covenant faithfulness and the favor of the Lord works throughout the ages. That's how it works in your life. If you give your life to the Lord and you serve him, and you seek him, your circumstances may be very trying at times, no question about it, but the blessing will flow, and you are called to allow it to leak out everywhere around you, the nature and the purpose of the kingdom of God. So Joseph is flourishing. God has filled the hands again. 
which, of course, is when the enemy's attack comes. And that, too, is the nature of things. And we all know, and we can relate, we can see times in our lives where this has happened. And then we say, Lord, where are you? What's happening here? I thought things were going well. God's presence does not prevent further suffering in Joseph's life. The presence of the Lord does not prevent suffering in your life. God can be present. You may feel abandoned. You may feel neglected. But don't get this one wrong. Just because you go through trial, it does not mean that he has removed himself from the equation. The story reminds us that he is with him in the midst of the fire and the flame. God is present, but he may not prevent the further suffering. And so enter Potiphar's wife. She is lonely, and she sees that Joseph is a good-looking guy. Obviously, it's the classic story of the husband who's out and about, and he's doing business, and he's got, you know, lots of things going on. His wife's probably at home, neglected, and she sees a handsome young man who's living in the house, and he's got the favor of the Lord. So it's kind of a no-brainer. She asks her to sleep with him. Some things never change in this world, right? Like, it can just happen. It can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter where you are, where you live, what country you're raised in, what color of your skin. None of it matters. This can happen anywhere, and it does. And it happens all through history. In this story, Joseph rejects her, saying, how could I commit this great evil and offend against God? So Joseph is presented to us as a faithful servant of the Lord, and he resists, which I'm sure was a very difficult thing for him to do. This may have been a great temptation. But day after day, she pursues him until finally she grabs hold of his coat and demands that he sleep with her. So what is up with Joseph's coat? Seriously, right? What's up with his coats? First, it's, you know, the undercoat that represents the blessing of the Father. So think of the connection here in the story. The coat represents and is symbolic for blessing. The coat is taken, and he falls into what appears to be the greatest curse of his life. He's sold into slavery, betrayed, and taken from his family into a foreign land. And then he ends up there, and he's reclothed. And this time, the lady, not the brothers, takes that coat. So is this a symbol of the blessing being removed? I think that's a question that the text wants to put before us here. What is it? What's going on? At that point, Joseph takes off, and he leaves his coat behind. Rejected again, she's now enraged and seeks revenge. When Potiphar comes home, she lies, she plays the victim, she accuses Joseph of trying to sleep with her and says, here's the evidence. It's the cloak. Which, of course, makes the man furiously angry. That's what the Hebrew literally says here. Furiously angry. The guy is absolutely and totally angry enraged. This is a betrayal of his trust. So there you see multiple layers in the story of betrayal starting to develop here. Some of them are true and some of them are false, but it's the same effect whether it's true or false. That's part of the paradox of life, right? You go through life and it's easy if you can see betrayal in your life and say, ah, that's what happened. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. 
other things happen, and there's betrayal, and you go, this doesn't make any sense. This is a lie. She's making up a story. She wants him out. So, he's taken, and he's thrown into the king's jailhouse, and this, these are the same words, the same verbs as was used when he was previously taken and thrown into the cistern. So once again, Joseph's life is a tragedy. Betrayal and suffering are at the heart of the story. On the surface, to the outsider, it appears that Joseph is cursed, not blessed. That's how it has to read. That's how we judge things, right? Like, if, if something like this is happening in somebody's life that you know, are you just going to come to the conclusion, oh, man, this guy's life's a tragedy. He must be blessed of the Lord. Of course not. That's not how we think. You see the outside, and you say, man, this guy's cursed. This is how these people fought. In the ancient world, right, this, this is how the psyche was. If people had lots of stuff, and they had lots of favor, and it looked like, you know, the, the, pe- the people liked them and they were successful, then that's blessing. If they were left in a state like this over and over, that's a curse. It's just the way it is. But we can't judge by appearances. The fact of human suffering is a present reality throughout the narrative and in all of our lives, but the important lesson is this. Hear me, God is with us in the trials, and he is faithful to the promises. He's present in the trials, and he's faithful to the promises, even if everything is stripped away. And maybe, especially when everything is stripped away. Like, that's tough. Really, really tough stuff. So again, I ask the question, what are you thinking right now? What's going on in your mind as I'm saying these words, as God is speaking to us here? Like, this is so clear, obviously, that God's just speaking from his word here. How are we processing the truth that God's presence doesn't always prevent suffering in your life. In fact, there's people in this room who have come to know the Lord because of their suffering. Precisely because God put them to the test in a fiery furnace. They know God They serve God. They understand something about God intuitively and experientially from the beginning because of this. It's a testimony. We've heard the testimony shared even from here this year as people have shared their stories. And so this morning, just very briefly... There's people in this room that don't even know who I am. Like, I'm, I'm looking out, and I'm seeing some of you know my story really well. Some of you are thinking, I don't really know who this person is at all. So I just want to say to you that as I preach through this, and I don't want to do this, okay? Like, this was something I was like, God, I don't want to. And he's like, yes, you're going to do it anyways. Is that when you see somebody's life, and you see them, you see the outside, right? I'm here today. That does not mean that this is where I've always been. When I look back 10 years in my life, my wife and I talked about this last night. We went through two or three years that were very, very difficult for us, extraordinarily difficult for us. I started off in ministry. I was in campus ministry. We lived in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My kids were born there. I worked in a campus context, I had a calling church, and we were involved with all kinds of other ministries in the city. Things were going very well. You know, I was thinking about this in terms of Joseph's life. 
things were going well. It seemed that God was blessing like almost everything. And then all of a sudden, some things started to happen. And some threads started to unravel. And all of a sudden, in the places where we least expected it, within the church even, within our relationships, you know, it's not outside people in this story. It's, it's us. It's the, it's, the, it's the people of God. There were problems. And without going into great detail or putting forward any blame, because I am responsible in these things as well, I'm not a victim, we went through a very traumatic time. And we had a, it, it ended up in the end of that ministry, actually, and it ended up bringing us back here, if you look at the bigger picture within a three-year span. So God's always at work. But there, Julie reminded me last night of something that I totally forgot about. Like, I, don't even, I didn't even remember the night before she said this last night. So when we were, like, really burning in the fire, and we were in a, not in a good place, I was not in a good place. And I was questioning, you know, ministry moving forward, basically. Um, we, there was this couple that lived in New Zealand, and they came over for a visit with a family that we knew who we were really close to. And they move in the prophetic. So these people, uh, you know, have an ability to hear from the Lord and speak into specific situations and to really lean into prayer with people. So we get, got together, we ate, we had some fellowship, and then we had this time of prayer. And now I remember, since Julie reminded me, we ended up on the floor. We were all kneeling and, you know, in that posture of, like, lament and weeping and stuff. And uh, apparently, the man, he gave this image. And it was the image of, uh, of a boat on the ocean. And it was a very dark picture. It was stormy. The swell was there. The waves were going. It was crashing. And the boat was moving and crashing. And it looked like the boat was going to go down. It was not a good situation. And then he said to us prophetically that that boat is us. It's my life. That's what the boat represents. But here it is. God is with you. He is with you both in the storm. And he won't let the boat sink. And so, think again about what you see when I stand before you today. Think about the Lord's faithfulness. Think about how he is faithful to his promise in the midst of the storms of life. And consider for yourself, right now, where is that with me? What have I gone through? You know, what experiences in your life might the Lord be wanting you to reevaluate today? And heal. Bring healing and restoration, and peace. Because if you are his, and he is with you, then the boat ain't sinking. Amen? The reality, though, is that suffering is not a theory. It's something we feel. The trials that we experience, experience in life are specific, they are deeply personal, and they are unique to each and every person. So we can't downplay the effect. And that's how the Bible presents all of this. That's part of the beauty of these stories. God is raw and honest about suffering, and Joseph is an example. Paul David Tripp, in his book, Suffering, says this, the Bible never presents suffering as an idea or a concept, but puts it before us in the blood and guts drama 
of real human life experiences. The Bible never minimizes the harsh experiences of life in this terribly broken world. And in so doing, the Bible forces us out of our denial and toward humble honesty. That's the process here this morning. It presents to the sufferer a God who understands, who cares. A God who cares about you, who invites us to come to him for help, and who promises one day to end all suffering of any kind once and for all. That is the ultimate promise. And it is the light in which we should see all of our sufferings and trials and tribulations in this life. It is what is going, it's the, it's the sun that's going to break through the clouds in the stormy sky and bring calm to the sea. That's what this is. This is the God who we worship. This is the God who created the universe and who cares about you. God's word uniquely gives us a glorious, honest, and hopeful picture of life with him in the midst of the trials and the tribulations. So the next time, maybe later today, when the enemy comes in and he tries to deceive on this point, remember what I'm saying. Hope God with us in the midst of present trial and tribulation, not always removing you from the situation. Remember that. God with us in the fire and the flame. And if we will allow the experience of suffering, whether physical, emotional, or psychological, has the power to expose our false sense of self-sufficiency and reveal the God who lovingly calls us to worship him above all other things. That's the opportunity. You can't get this anywhere else. This message doesn't come anywhere else. But in the midst of God's people worshiping the Lord comes from his word, comes from his presence in this place and it has the potential to leak out everywhere in all of the lives of the people who you interact with and encounter and so take this take this food and share it with a starving world my friends i appeal to you pat what was that word that you said that was in the king james in Romans, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is your act of worship. The heart of the Christian faith is that God uses your painful experiences to reveal Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us. And so we have now arrived. We've arrived at center. Jesus, who the prophets said was God with us. The Joseph story looks ahead to this gospel reality, which leads us to the beautiful hope of the complete redemption and healing 
of the world and your life. Jesus came in the flesh to bear your sin on the cross, taking upon himself your sorrow and your suffering and your shame as Emmanuel, God with you. That's what the scripture says. As we will sing now, we are going to declare this after I preach. Jesus is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. He is the light in the darkness. For all of you sports fans out there, if that's what you like, that's, I, I like this. My son, he loves this. This is the moment for him. Jesus is the goat. You got it? Jesus is the goat. He is the greatest of all time. <laughs> for those who don't dwell in sport land right? He's the greatest. He's the man. He is your great deliverer, the great goat. Look to him, not mere mortals. Don't look to your sports idols and your, you know, American idols and whatever other false idols. Look to Jesus. The Word become flesh. Come to live among us as Emmanuel, revealing grace and truth, John 1. Jesus, the very nature of God, Philippians 2, 6, the image of the invisible God in the flesh, Colossians 1, 15, the one in whom the fullness of the Godhead, the Godhead lives in bodily form, God with you, Colossians 2, 9. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of of God and the exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1.3 Emmanuel, God, with you. The exact representation. And Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the trial and the suffering, scorning its shame, and was vindicated, risen, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 12, 2. To know Him, to know God with you, is to know the Father and to receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, which is the very love of God shed abroad in you. To know Jesus is to experience God with us. And it is my prayer today, my friends, that this will be our story and our song, not only today, but for all of life. Amen.